age of steam. Made in Britain, it was one of the greatest technological breakthroughs the world had ever seen. The train powered Britain's rise to the summit of imperial power, and it changed everything from the food we could eat to the work we could do. Born in the 1830s, the age of steam lasted 130 years and then was gone. But today, as the rest of the world powers towards the future, Close on the truck. a network of 22,000 volunteers and 4,000 staff, like station managers, signalmen, engineers, and drivers, are working together on 130 heritage lines carrying 8 million of us every year. To see the sight, the sounds, the smells, the steam, the coal, everything. It's all there. Wonderful. This is the story of the people who are keeping our railway heritage alive. For them, the age of steam never ended. This is Steam Train Journeys. Of all the heritage railways dotted around the world, the oldest is the Festiniog and Welsh Highland Railway, opened in 1832. Carnarvon station manager Stephen Gregg... Yes, the two bonquettes. ..is in the thick of final preparations for the latest addition to the line. Yeah. The cleaners will be cursing us. The line runs for 40 miles, from Carnarvon in the north, through the Snowdonia National Park, all the way down to Porth Maddock. The railway attracts 400,000 passengers annually, and its home, Carnarvon, is still dominated by its 14th century castle. And tomorrow is a big day for the railway. Stephen and his team will oversee the grand opening of a brand new three million pound station. We're expecting about 170 people to arrive here on a train from Dinas at the line, and they're going to come in here, have a drinks reception, have some speeches, and then we're going to have a buffet which the girls are preparing for us in house, so they're doing a really good job. And like many of the staff and volunteers on heritage lines, Stephen's love affair with the railways goes way back. I used to volunteer at the railways, did what we call Kids Week, as, and um, that's when young volunteers can come and get involved with the railway, and um, carried on from there, started working on the trains. I was hooked and became a guard and signalman, buffet steward, worked on the trains for years and years as a volunteer. I was a teacher by trade, and then when the job as customer services manager came up, I thought, well, who doesn't want to go and get paid for working for the railway they love? And I applied and got the job. How are we getting on with the food, girls? Yeah, it smells great in that cafe, I must say. Excited? Yeah. Terrified? Yeah. <laughs> Be fine. Any questions? No? Let's go. So the Welsh Highland Railway is the most modern of heritage railways. We've got modern carriages built by our team in Boston Lodge. So we wanted a modern station that's going to work out for the modern tourist and be fit for purpose. Getting enough volovants and vegetarian options ready in time has pushed Stephen and his staff to the limit. Right, how are we getting on? Quick update. Oh, wow. Are they, they're the... That's the... So it's the hummus. Hummus, beetroot, is it? That's the beetroot wraps. Beetroot wraps, yeah. They're vegetarian, aren't they? With hummus inside, lovely. Everything else is all right? Yeah, cool, okey doke. People have worked very, very, very hard to get the railway rebuilt, and this is a nice modern building that's going to be able to be a present to those people and a legacy. The East Lancashire Railway runs for 12 and a half miles from Rottenstall in South East Lancashire through five other stations to Haywood in Greater Manchester. Like all the major heritage lines, 
the East Lanx is heavily reliant on rolling stock that's at least 50 years old. Their workshop here at Barron Street handle over 90 examinations of engines and carriages each year. At least one major overhaul and several repaints. All overseen by manager Lee Kenny. The more courses for me, the, uh, the essence of what Heritage Rail is, what it embodies, is, is to actually bring back the years of 1950s, 60s and earlier than that, of how rail travel used to be, and the smell, the sound, it's so magical an experience, and you fall in love with them. You do, you really do. Even though some mornings when it's hammering down with rain and you're crawling around one of these things at four o'clock in the morning preparing it for service, you grumble. But once, you, but once you're on the engine and the engine's going down the line, it's second to none. The day-to-day -day services run by the East Lanx Railway operate like a well-oiled machine. In 10 days' time, it will begin its hugely popular and lucrative afternoon tea service. But there's a problem. The buffet cars have been undergoing a major refurbishment, and they're not finished. Worse still, the two bogies, the units that sit on top of the wheels, have also been removed and need a major overhaul. The vehicle's still got no bogies underneath it. Um, there's still all the brake system testing still to be done. There's a multitude of other things that we need to make sure the vehicle's fit for service. Hopefully, it should be all be here by the end of this week. Catch. Right, cat light -like reflexes. Cat light -like summit. Yeah. Not got nine lives, have you? That'll do. One second. Open. Foreman, Jonathan Valentine's job, is to strip down the two four and a half ton bogies, refurbish and reassemble them before finally reattaching them underneath the buffet car. Railways like East Lanx rely heavily on visitor revenue. Failure to get the carriages back in service for the lucrative summer season would be a serious blow. Bogies basically takes all the weight of the, of the vehicle between two of them, so you've got one at each end, and it allows the coach to pivot and go around corners. A bogey is the unit that sits on top of the wheels and attaches to the underside of the carriage. But Jonathan has identified a problem. These bogies have too much suspension, resulting in the whole carriage riding too high. In layman's terms, you should be able to get your fingers between there when the weight of the coach is on it, and at the minute you can't, so we're having to adjust the spring in and the height on the springs to bring that down so we've got the right clearance as to what it should be as in the manuals. People just think it rolls in a workshop and magic happens over a night or a couple of days and it comes back out all shiny and new. Not the, the amount of work that has to go into them. It's, it's a long time. The first job is to separate the bogey from the wheels below it. No, you're miles off. I know. But it soon becomes apparent that a couple of small hydraulic pumps are not up to the job. Happily, there's a solution, a giant crane. With the top and bottom halves of the bogey now separated, the all-important springs can be removed. As Jonathan suspects, they may be the problem. If they were broken, you'd have... They usually break round here, so if that was broke, it'd, it'd have just come off, because they don't usually crack, don't coil springs. So they just break. But these are all right, actually. They're quite, quite good. They're really. quite good. They just want cleaning up. So we no broken Paint. ones then? No, no, no broken ones. Yeah. Probably 30 years plus of um, rust and debris. You can see how much damage water does over years and years. The workshops of all the heritage railways frequently perform miracles restoring damaged stock. The springs are rusty, but otherwise in good condition. It'll be all right, I think. Well, soon time will tell. With extensive cleaning 
and protective layers of anti-corrosion paint, the springs can be reused. But if the springs aren't the problem, what is? The springs sit on discs or packers, which are badly corroded, and all the accumulated rust is now pushing the carriage upwards. There's only one solution, elbow grease. All the rust has been removed from the spring pockets, so the next process is put all the springs back in place, new packers, because the ones we've taken out are obviously a bit corroded and a bit naff, and then put it all back together and underneath the boat, underneath the coach, which will be a few days' time. With far more rust on the bogey than is normal, Jonathan knows he's up against it to get finished on time. Seven working days from being like this to going under the coach, to going to the other end, to stripping the other bogey, to do the same, to get it out that door. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's 5 a.m. in the sidings at the Great Central Railway's Loughborough Depot. And Aaron Crawford is training to be a fireman here. On the railways, a fireman doesn't put fires out. He or she starts them. At the moment, I'm just uh, collecting some Welsh coal. We tend to light the engines up on Welsh coal because it doesn't give off uh, as much black smoke, keeps the neighbours happy. So, uh, unfortunately, I've got to do this one manually rather than take it out of the tender. <laughs> Today, Aaron's locomotive, 73156, will be running for eight miles between Leicester North and Loughborough Central. In principle, a steam engine is a wonderfully simple machine. Water is boiled to produce high-pressure steam, which expands into a reservoir and then released into a cylinder which pushes a piston and turns the wheels. Four hours from now, Aaron needs to have the steam pressure up at 180 psi, which is enough to move the train. The first thing we do is we, uh, we cover the grate in a uh, layer of coal, in this case Welsh coal as a, almost a nice, even bed. This is a bed for, some, for the fire to get a hold on. Afterwards, we will add uh, a layer of wood. And on top of that, parrot some paraffin soaked rags. Now, the fire then takes hold in a, what I like to call a chain reaction. We, look, we set fire to the paraffin rags, paraffin rags set fire to the wood, and the wood set fire to the coal. Great Central Railway's success depends not just on an army of volunteers, but also 100 full-time specialist employees like Peter Maynard. I just filled a, uh, an oil reservoir there, and it's sealed with a cork, which is similar to a wine bottle cork, but it's got a reed in there which allows the cork to breathe because when the oil goes down, it um, needs to be replaced by air, otherwise you can't get the cork out. This morning, his job is to ensure the loco has enough oil, but he's got his work cut out. A steam train can have up to 100 oiling points on axles, bearings, wheel sidebars and brakes. And Peter has just three and a quarter hours to get the job done. While Peter sorts out his lubrication, fire starter Aaron needs to put his foot on the gas. We've got a nice even coverage over the uh, surface of the grate. And now what we need to do is uh, put a wood layer on top of that. Getting the boiler up to pressure can take up to eight hours. The solution? A warming fire left burning overnight, which then gives the fireman a head start first thing in the morning. With a warm engine, you're probably looking at about four hours to get up to a, a decent working pressure and once all the preparations have been completed as well. So these rags have been nicely doused in uh, paraffin. What I tend to do is just uh, spread a few here, there and everywhere. Nice one. Just underneath the door. And then with a the lighter... That is the start of your fire. 
So now what will happen is the paraffin rag will set fire to the wood and the wood in turn will set fire to the coal. Shut the door. Treat her with respect and she'll do anything for you. Um, it's just one of... I suppose it's just one of them sayings, you know, and it's very true. You have to be... You find... Uh, I certainly know many former British Rails... British Rail crew, you know, as they're going along, they'll say, you know, come on, love, let's get on with it and all this sort of thing, and... Uh, they can be big, brute it men, but uh, they'll be so genteel with a locomotive. It's a funny thing, really, but uh, I suppose they evoke that sort of uh, sort of affection, yeah. In the workshops of the East Lancashire Heritage Railway. Right, you everyone ready? Jonathan Valentine and his team have spent days removing tons of rust from two bogies or wheel frames to hopefully solve a big problem. The passenger carriages that sit on top of them are riding too high. The bogies have had tons of rust removed, have been repainted and are ready to be reunited with their wheels. But it's an operation that requires patience and real engineering expertise. The bogie frame is four and a half tons, imperial tons. And with the wheel set in all, all up, it's six and a half tons. The wheels must be aligned precisely with the bogey hovering above it. We'll bring it down and then... Wait, mine's miles away. Going right. Right, we'll bring it down closer. Jonathan only has a couple of millimetres to play with. Do I go back a bit? During this delicate operation. This side's nearly in. Going down. Right, mine's in. Yeah, mine's in as well. Might have to square the wheel set up, Dave. How far's your off, Wendy? I'm not far off at all. Right, hold it there then. Because at the minute, it's sat like that. An exaggeration, it needs to be square. This is heavy metal, precision engineering. Liam, you all right? Yep, everything's good on this side. All blocks in. You in? OK. You in, Wendy? Yeah, it looks that way. It went easier than I thought, actually. Too easy. There must be something wrong if it goes together too easy. Yeah. It means I must have done it right. It's quite easy when it's on the crane, because it just flows about quite nicely. But setting the wheel sets square into the axle boxes like we had to do isn't so easy. But sometimes it can be quite hard work. With bogies and wheels finally reunited, there's one last stage to complete. Next step will be lift the coach and roll the bogies underneath and let the coach back down onto the bogies and hopefully, with what we've done, all the weight will distribute evenly through the bogies and it'll sit lovely and level. But we never know until we do it. Are we ready? With their shoulders literally to the wheel, each man and one woman is pushing more or less a tonne apiece. Rail joint. No, keep going, keep going. Keep going. That's it. Both refurbished bogies are now being positioned close to the passenger carriage, which will then be lifted, lowered, and reattached. That's it. Fantastic. This single track line was built by the owners of the slate mines at Blyneye Festiniog to connect to the waiting ships down at Porth Maddock. And one of the rarest engines to ever work this route is now lovingly cared for by David Fisher. Uh, well, her name's Chaloner and she's built in 1877 across the road in the factory over there. She was built for uh, Penrosset Quarry in Nantler and she worked there from 1877 till 1954. 
and then she was laid up in 1954, and my father bought her in 1960 for scrap. They were used for, initially, getting the slate from the pit. In, in the case of Penwell Fed, the, the slate was in a pit, and to access the pit, they had a tunnel. So she used to work through a tunnel to get the, the stone from the, so from the quarries into the mills. So in the mills, they then slit, sliced it, put it, split it rather, and put it into to the size and slate, made slates from it. And after that, there was a lot of waste. So like a lot of um, small railways, there are hundreds of engines like this supporting the main lines, delivering the, delivering the, the local quarry materials to, to be taken away by a larger railway. This locomotive has a unique engine configuration, with the boiler arranged vertically, a completely revolutionary design. You would imagine this, this was like uh, the latest iPhone in the time it was built. This would place horses. Before this, you needed 20 horses. It saved them a fortune. But this was, a, this was now so iconic to them. To have an engine on your quarry was like something special, so they, they named it after their daughters. And with the train from Dinas due any second now, it's time for David to take Chaloner back home. It's 8 a.m. in the Loughborough depot of the Great Central Railway. For the last three hours, trainee fireman Aaron Crawford has been firing up the boiler of Steam Loco 73156. So the inside of the box is starting to take hold now. You can see that it's not just the rags burning. You can hear the wood crackling away as well. So she's off. Uh, she'll be on the way now, hopefully. A bit of luck. Yeah. <laughs> You give the cab a decent clean, yeah? Oh, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. Sweep her out and whatnot. Well, once you've got your bottles, I'll start cleaning her up. We've uh, got a bit of a, a sunroof, so just adds a bit of ventilation to the cab and a bit of light as well, which is always good. Just trying to keep an eye on the black smoke as well, cos uh, obviously we've got neighbours around, so uh, make sure we don't create too much smoke, you know. Hopefully they haven't left the washing out or anything like that. <laughs> right. A once mighty network, the Great Central Railway began a long decline, starting in 1948, finally closing completely in 1969. But over the last 40 years, track has been purchased, stations rebuilt, Signals restored, and old iron horses rescued from the knacker's yard. And a hardy band of enthusiasts like steam fitter Simon Horobin refused to let the patient die. So this locomotive is a BR standard class five, number 73156, built 1956 in Doncaster Works. And these were built for mixed traffic use, primarily, on the railways. So that is secondary passenger duties and fast freight, in, in effect. Bit of a workhorse of anything that they needed it to do, really. Simon's job is to complete all the mechanical checks on 73156 by the time Aaron has the boiler up to pressure. Most of it's a visual examination of the locomotive. There's lots of um, parts that could work loose, such as the tyres, which are fitted to the, the wheels, or nuts and bolts all around the motion. As the, engine's, as the engine's working, obviously the wheels are turning and all the rods are, are whipping round. The, these sort of things are liable to work loose. So it starts as a visual examination, and then I've got 
basically fitness to run hammer, a small hammer, just tapping all the parts and you're listening to the sound of them to tell if they're tight. And also, as you, as you do hit them with a hammer, you can obviously see anything that's working loose. Things like here, this large nut here kicks the, the little end of the connecting rod into the cross head. It's quite an important nut. That's nice and tight, and it's got the safety cotter through it, through the, the slots in the nut, prevents it from working loose, as it were. And then it's, uh, again, a bit of a listening and feeling kind of thing, and, but mainly looking. If that was to drop out, this the connecting rod would drop down and it's the engine's in motion. So it's quite uh, serious stuff. We have to check all these nuts and bolts are nice and tight. As you can hear there, that's a nice tight nut, that is. There's no, uh, no play in any of them. This examination will probably take me about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and then it'll last for four days is our uh, railways policy, and that after that four days, another person will have to come and examine the locomotive. There are now just two days until the restored buffet cars are needed for the East Lanx Railway's first afternoon tea service of the season. At the East Lanx Barron Street Depot, two bogies have been reassembled and await the carriages to be lowered back onto them. But first, foreman Jonathan Valentine has a vital task to perform with an unusual material. With more speed, the coach rocks more. So it, it, it tends to, to tilt on the, body, on the body, side to side a bit, when it's rocking. What we do is just put the horse air in, pour it in oil, and then it just nicely lubricates the top bearing blocks. You're playing with old toys in a modern world. Forty-eight hours, two days. So it's getting a bit close to the to the crunch, as we say. But it'll get there. It always does. With last-minute checks complete, everything's set. Now we're just getting the lifting jack set up with the cables and everything to the control unit over there. Lower the vehicle back down, making sure all the pins and everything engage. Then basically it's final components underneath on the bogies and connect it up to the brake system. And once that's done, then the vehicle will go back to the carriage works across the road for basically final exam. We've got to make sure the job's right, everything's right. 20 tonnes of railway carriage must be gently lowered back onto the bogies. First, each one must be wheeled into position at either end of the carriage. Millimetre perfect. Well, mm. oh, shit, I just push. Sorry, Lee, that's your finger. Whoa. Stars. It's like Starship Enterprise. <laughs> right, everyone happy? Yeah. Right, going down. After a few anxious moments, the carriage docks perfectly with the bogey. Yeah, you're entered this end. That's a big weight off my shoulders having it on its wheels. It really is. Oh, that's lovely, that. I think once the vehicle settled down, I think it'll be about right. It'll be pretty much bang on. Happy as a pig in lamb, I tell you. <laughs> All that remains is for Jonathan to tighten any connecting bolts. And with that done, this train is a step closer to active duty. 
all the doors have been checked, the brake system's all been checked. Uh, everything, basically, our, part of our exam routine has been checked and signed off, ready to go. So uh, that side of things is great. So it's just basically off we go now. Refurbishment work is labour intensive and time consuming, which means that Jonathan and his team would rather do a good job now than have to do it again later. Seven years, probably before it needs a repaint, and the interior will go for longer. It's because it's not highly used, it's not out there every day. It's just afternoon teas or dining train. So it's, I don't know, 15 years. Hopefully the bogies will see me out now. I should hope so anyway, after the amount of hours I've put into them. <laughs> and despite the grime that he can never get out from under his fingernails, like every other railway man and woman, it's the romance that truly endures. I absolutely love it. I love the railway, I love the people. It's, it, coming to work is just like another family. It, we are just one big family and we all look after each other. If we've got a problem, we'll try and help each other. It's not just a team, it's, it's family. The railway is a family. Hello. With just a few hours to spare, the buffet carriage heads off for its final safety checks. Gone, done, over the road for finalisation. Thank God for that. <laughs> the Great Central Railway runs for just over eight miles from Loughborough to Leicester, and it's currently the only twin track heritage railway in the world. Heritage Railways are keen to recruit and keep young staff, which means the long apprenticeships of the past are a thing of the past. Back in BR days, for example, they'd have been doing 20 plus years on the, on the shovel before they'd even have been dreamed of being promoted to uh, being a fireman. Whereas these days, it's uh, really based on your ability. Have you, uh, do you know enough about the locomotives? Do you know enough about railway operation? I love it. Um, you've got to love it. There's no point doing this job if you don't, because uh, you need a bit of dedication and a bit of, uh, a bit of patience. Uh, even here, you're probably not going to be... This, we get some people coming down and they want to go straight for driving. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, you know. It's, uh, you need to uh, serve your time, as it were. It's a hard old job at the end of the day, and it uh, can be very dangerous if it's not done correctly. So, uh, yeah, you need to take your time and enjoy it. It's now 7 a.m and Aaron needs to ensure that the pressure is heading up towards 180 pounds per square inch. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing good, mate. Very good. Is the needle going the right way? It's going up, 40 pounds. Oh, good, off. Splendid. Lovely jubbly. Well, now we've got a nice wedge of pressure on there, we can start to uh, test the injectors. Uh, the injectors uh, are the uh, bit of equipment on an engine which uh, put water into the boiler or replenish the water in the boiler. We use these valves down here, so we've got two valves there indicated by the colour and another set here. Yeah, so I'll give that a try now. Because steam engines rely on huge amounts of pressure, it's vital that all valves have been fully tested before the train leaves the depot. So that one's working. We've uh, tested the injectors, everything's pretty good and ready to go. I think I'm gonna go get changed and get into something more presentable. <laughs> right. 
After just over two years under construction, the hotly anticipated three million pounds Carnarvon station will have its grand opening today. And manager Stephen Gregg is hoping that his prawn sandwiches will be the talk of the town. The station is designed to serve as a gateway to the 26-mile Welsh Highland Railway line through Snowdonia to Porth Maddock. And it's hoped it will add an extra 5,000 passengers each year. So it's vital that today goes smoothly. Do we want to make it so that people can walk round both sides and then the staff are at either end? So otherwise you're going to get it all. Yeah, people queue. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So I think they need to come out a little stuck. We're going to do diamonds or...? I think the, um, the thespian in me likes the theatre to, to be right, so this is all part of the art of performance and the artist side of me, so... Just want to make sure everything looks amazing. Yep, that looks good. Borada, borada, borada. Suited and booted, and confident that the sausage rolls will be ready in time, Stephen is ready to join in the excitement. So, I'm now going up to Dinas to go and do meet and greet with all the guests and come on the train with them down to the station. Time to go. When the Welsh Highland Railway opened in 1997, it only ran for three miles between Carnarvon and the next station, Dinas. It's exciting. So here we are in Dinas, this is the good shed, and this is where we're doing our meet and greet. So these, this is where the 170 guests are congregating. And over here they're going to collect a name badge from our volunteers that are working on the tables here. And then we're going to get on the train, and from here we're going to go down on the train to arrive at the new station. And 25 minutes after leaving Dinas, hordes of expectant and hopefully hungry guests arrive in Carnarvon. The new station is designed to cope with 200 people at arrival and departure times, which means today is the perfect test run. But before Stephen's sandwiches are put to the test, it's time for the chairman of the Heritage Lottery Fund, Sir Peter Luff. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fest in York and Welsh Island Railways, and wel welcome to our new Carnarvon station. So far, so good. And this station is modern. There wasn't any old station here to restore. This is an old railway site, it dates back to 1828, but it was never a station site. So this railway very de deliberately looks to the future. Mine troy plesia alamarav in me the canavada agorum now. Now it gives me real pleasure to declare it open. I'm just so impressed Stylish. with the stuff. They've done Fabulous. it. They've done it all themselves. Have they really? What do you think, Dave? What do you think? This is the first time we've been here, isn't it, since it's been finished? And with his work here done, Stephen and some fellow travellers jump at the chance for a free ride back up the line. Someone else will be doing the washing up. Thank you. 
after laboring for 10 days straight to rebuild a pair of bogies and reattach them to a refurbished buffet carriage, foreman Jonathan Valentine and his colleagues at the East Lanx Railway can finally pause for breath. Today is, is, is afternoon tea day. They, they both, the pair of them, roll out the shed together and then put on the back of the service train that's up there and then all the customers at 11.55 can get on and have a nice afternoon tea and I can watch my hard labour roll up the countryside and hopefully go with it on the first trip to make sure they're all right. Touch wood, they'll be fine. <laughs> and for all these railway romantics, today is all about much more than just a job well done. I am very happy these two are ready to roll. Um, happy and relieved. Uh, and, uh, you know, really proud of the team and what they've achieved and the timescale they had. And today's afternoon tea service is not just about whether there are enough scones and doilies on board. It's a chicken and egg situation where you've got to invest in the vehicles, get them out there earning money, so then we can actually back invest in bringing people into the organisation to actually help us run the railway. The team have done such a wonderful job that you just, you can't thank them enough. You know, I've put stupid amounts of hours in to get them ready. This was a wreck when it came in. There was so much rotten panels in it, so many rotten corners. You know, they've, they've all just done a brilliant job and, and I can't thank them enough. <laughs> For the one hour, 45 minute trip through Somerset, Ramsbottom and Irwell Vale, today's 85 passengers probably agree that today has been the grandest of grand days out. It's the only way to travel, isn't it? It's, it's something that's, that's been saved and it's, the, the engines themselves have, have a life. We were brought up with these, steam trains. Right, when we were lads, we wanted to be a, a train driver. driver. A chance to travel in the old railway carriages and to experience what people experienced years ago. Thank you.